Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, spending time with me this afternoon. And my apologies for having you squeeze into this tiny room. But if I may ask, uh, if you can come even closer, you'll be able to see this, the code snippets that I'm going to show later. So if you want to do that, you can uh, move forward. Uh, so let me uh, start by talking about myself. Uh, I'm uh, Atul Tulchibagwale. I'm the CTO of Signal.ai, uh, SGNL.ai. And we are into continuous authorization or continuous access management. And if you would like to know what that is, uh, you can all go to our website after my talk. Um, and some of you might know me from my work on standards called the Continuous Access Evaluation Protocol, something I started when I was at Google and has now grown into this uh, pretty um, sort of big movement. But this, uh, this presentation is about another exciting standard that I'm working on in the IETF called Transaction Tokens. And it helps you uh, secure your identity and authorization in microservices. So let's get started. So um, why do we need this, right? So uh, as you know, like uh, any uh, modern architecture, you know, external calls to an uh, API or an application will result in a lot of calls internally to various microservices, right? And um, the in this diagram, that external API microservice encapsulates any like network infrastructure that you might have, right? So, um, but the important thing is that these calls are short-lived, right? They're, they don't exceed a few minutes of execution at any given point of time. And even if you have sort of MapReduce or some large processes running, they will finally result into calls that last a few uh, minutes or less uh, individually, right? So you can think of these internal calls that propagate through your uh, internal services as always being short-lived. Now, um, Unfortunately, there are a lot of attacks that are possible where a VPC might be compromised. And as you might know, some of the recent uh, pretty um, damaging attacks have been as a result of compromise of privileged users um, that, you know, that were uh, compromising the VPCs of companies, right? And this can result in user impersonation or you know, arbitrary code in, uh, execution, right? And so extremely damaging uh, to any enterprise that needs it. So obviously, we need to do more uh, about security than what we have. So today, most commonly, people use implicit trust. If you're in the VPC, you can just call any service. And um, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, because you're in the VPC, you're fine. You're trusted, which is not great. Um, you know, there's something that has come up with, uh, recently, which is you know, service-to-service -service trust, where you have some kind of a trust infrastructure. And I'll get into that, uh, how it works and all that. And, but you have establish trust between a service and another service and make sure that only those services that are configured properly can be called, can, can call other services, right? Now, what we want to get to is user trust. This means that you have the service-to-service -service trust, but you also can assure the identity of the user that is calling. So you cannot, let's say, you know, Joe is calling um, uh, a service externally. The internal service cannot change that to say, oh, instead of Joe, it's like, uh, Atul, who is calling uh, the other service, right? You, you cannot do that. And that's, that's what I mean by user trust. And then finally, you get to assured context, which means that if Joe is making a call externally and saying, I want to buy 100 shares of Microsoft, the internal service cannot say, it's Joe, but not, he actually wants to sell 1,000 shares of Google. You cannot do that, right, With, when you have the assured con context. And so as you can see, the the, the you know, the level of uh, security that you get uh, increases as you get down the scale. Now, practically speaking, most of us are, are over here right now. You know, save for a few companies that have uh, implemented their own ways of doing everything. Uh, but as, a, as an industry, we need to be down there in order to um, be secure, right? In order to get secure outcomes uh, and for people to be able to trust what we are doing, right? And so, how do you get there, right? So before we get there, let's talk about how, how a microservice infrastructure can be, can be attacked, right? Now, the most common thing is the privileged user compromise. And like I was saying, this is something that has happened very frequently recently in a very highly publicized attacks. And it can be done through the credential compromise or through session hijacking where somebody just steals the token after you've done all your strong authentication and all that. And so it doesn't matter that you've implemented the best you know, pass keys or whatever security mechanism that you want, but 
if the session gets hijacked after that, then you know, you're kind of lost after that. Um, so the, what the attacker can do is they can make spurious calls. They can you know, uh, uh, insert their own services uh, into the VPC. And it's effectively like remote code execution in the cloud, right? And so terrible, terrible uh, compromise. The other one is, uh, you know, there may be malicious insiders, and they may have different motivations. Uh, you may want, you may have people trying to benefit financially on the side while doing their job, or you may have people who are disgruntled employees and want to compromise something about their employers. Uh, but there is also this category about, you know, curious insiders, like. If I have sensitive data about my customers and a customer service rep wants to say, hey, you know, let me see where Taylor Swift, Swift li lives because she's one of her customers. You, you shouldn't allow that kind of stuff to happen because that is a huge liability for the company, right? And so you want to protect against a malicious insider attack as well, right? And then finally, you also have the software bill of materials kind of, you know, or the software supply chain kind of compromise, right? Where um, you know, you think your service is secure, but in your CI/CD process or something, there's some code that gets in and that calls home and then sort of brings down code or, or is able to like modify the behavior of the service that is running, right? And so, to protect against these and and other attacks that you know maybe uh, I haven't included in this presentation, uh, let's talk about how to do that, right? And so, the the before we get into the specifics, let's just say that. You know, trust is fundamental to all this, right? And trust is established using, I mean, you, you know, you get privacy, security, integrity through all these PKI and, you know, uh, finally, the, you know, certificates and all of that. But the trust establishment is, is the fundamental thing in all this, right? And how is that done? It's done using two things. It's using either, you know, transport level security like TLS or it's done using digital signatures, right? And those are the you know, most common ways of doing it. Maybe there are others, but for practical purposes, this is, this is what it is. Um, now, you need, in order to verify signatures, in order to verify certificates, you need to know the public keys, right? And then you have the public key infrastructure, like you know, public CAs and all that. But also, like, you have mechanisms of distributing public keys within your VPC. Like, if you're using Spiffy or Spire, you'll have a way of distributing these keys inside your enterprise. But just be, just be aware that that is a key place to compromise because if somebody is able to t change the roots in your uh, trust domain, then all, all bets are off because that is the basis of the security that you're having in your, in your VPC or in your infrastructure. Now, I talked about the four models. So I'm going to go a little bit into the details of what those four models are. Uh, so the first thing is the implicit trust in, in microservices, right? So uh, this is just you've deployed stuff into your um, uh, infrastructure, into your VPC. Just by way of their existence in the VPC, you just trust that anybody calling my microservice, it's fine because they're inside the VPC, and I, I'm not going to check anything about the, about the caller, and I'm just going to uh, respond with anything. So this is... Uh, this is catastrophic when, when the VPC gets compromised. And you, you'll see in, if you analyze some of the attacks, you know, this has happened. And unfortunately, this is, uh, this is a problem today. Um, now, the next step is you identify the service that is calling. So if there are two services or maybe five services, you've configured each service uh, in a way that says, this service may only be called by these other two services, right? And when those service co uh, services call, using Spiffy or something, you identify that this is the service calling me and only trust those calls. And you don't let other services call you, right? And as a result, uh, you know, you get um, uh, better security because you, an attacker can't just inject their own uh, service into the VPC and uh, start calling. Or if a, um, you know, relatively unused service is compromised, that's okay because it's not configured to call anything and, and the damage can be mitigated, right? But, you know, you still have a lot of vectors that are uh, still unprotected, right? Now, uh, like I said, you know, you see that little green logo over there, that's the Spiffy logo. And, you know, if you haven't looked into Spiffy, I would highly recommend you to look into Spiffy. Uh, it gives you a great way to do service-to-service -service trust. There's actually a little booth in the, uh, on the show floor uh, about Spiffy, you can go over there after the talk and, and talk to those guys. Um, 
and it's, I think, the most common way in which people are uh, doing service-to-service -service trust right now. And so let's talk about you know, where we want to go, right? We want to go to user trust. And how, what does that mean, right? It means that um, you can be assured not just about the service that is calling, but if, let's say, an external user, say Joe, is calling, then you will know at every service in the call chain that it is Joe that is making the call, right? That cannot be changed. And how to do that, we'll get into, but that's the meaning of user trust, right? So it mitigates a lot of the attacks because now you have a big limitation on, um, you know, you cannot do user impersonation in, in, the, in the call chain, even if you attack the VPC, but at the same time, you can still uh, change the parameters, right? And the best security that you can get is, uh, you know, the assured context. What that means is that it's not just that you're uh, assured of this is the user is calling, you're also assured that this is the user and this is what they uh, are expressing that they want to do, right? And so if it's Joe calling and saying, I want to buy 100 shares of Microsoft, down the call chain, you will know that, yes, the, that was indeed the way in which that initial call was made, right? And so there's no way of changing these things. Um, and so how do you get there, right? So we are introducing this concept called TRATS, you know, transaction tokens. This is a um, currently an individual draft in the IETF OAuth working group. It's being, uh, you know, and I couldn't go to that uh, meeting of IETF because I'm attending here and speaking here, but it is actually being proposed as an, uh, you know, proposed to be adopted as a working group draft soon. So hopefully in a few months time, uh, we should see an RFC come out of all this. And so what are they? They're basically just short-lived jots that assure the call context and the user identity, right? And so I've told you what tracks is, and you know, I think we can end the presentation here. But let's get into a little bit of details, right? So, so like I said, it's a short-lived jot. Um, and it uniquely identifies a specific call chain, right? So when, when an external call comes in, it sets that context and it's able to identify down the chain that this is, this is what the user was trying to do. This is when they called, you know, all those details and I'll get into what all those things are. But it, it assures the user identity. Uh, it assures, the, it assigns a transaction identifier so that the whole call chain sort of hangs off of that one external transaction. And it has the originator information, like which was the endpoint that was called, you know, what was the user IP address that was called from, and all those things. And um, you know, what is the purpose of the call? There's something, uh, and I'll get into what the purpose is. And then the transaction context, like you know, what is the user actually trying to do? What are the parameters? Um, you know, things like that may not be in the call uh, external call, but you can have some computed values, like what is the assurance level of the user, and things like that. And so uh, all that comprises a, a, a transaction token. So the, the benefits here are basically that you can uh, you know, limit damage uh, even if your VPC is compromised. And you can do that by Im providing an immutable context throughout the call chain, right? So you basically can configure each service to say, unless I can verify that uh, I, uh, transaction token, uh, I'm not going to do anything. And so as a result, if any spurious calls are made or if any parameters are changed, doesn't matter because the transaction token cannot be modified and so you, know, you, you now have uh, a way of preventing damage, right? And there is one limitation in the way transaction tokens work today and there's some future work that I'm gonna go into uh, in the talk that you can still have a possibility that a service in the middle grabs a transaction token and then reuses it uh, you know, uh, bypassing some other checks in between. And so there is, there is no call chain, you know, uh, information inside the transaction token. And, and I'll get into how to fix that. But for now, because the transaction tokens are short-lived, less than five minutes or, you know, whatever you want to configure it, but less than what it'll take for you to execute the entire call chain, typically it's not going to be more than a few minutes. You, the chance of reusing those transaction tokens to do a replay attack or something are very small. And so it's okay to um, have that possibility for the sake of efficiency. What you'd really like is, hey, you know, uh, I know that Joe called to uh, buy 100 shares of Microsoft, but has the fraud protection service actually processed that call? I need to know that that was 
executed before I can execute the trade, right? So if you can have that kind of an assurance, that would be even better, but that's something that we are not covering in the current spec. We are uh, proposing that for later, and I'll get into that. So, so let's talk about you know, what exactly goes into a transaction token, right? So there's an issuer, like this is uh, who created the transaction token, and then we'll get into how it gets created and all that. Uh, there's an issued at time and an expiration time, and like I said, the expiration time is typically a very small window. And um, the audience is the trust domain in which that transaction token can be used. Um, then there is the transaction identifier that stays constant throughout the call chain. Uh, there's the subject identifier, uh, there's the request context, uh, and then there is the uh, purpose of the call, and then uh, there are the authorization details, right? Let's get into all those things uh, now. So um, the subject identifiers in, in transaction tokens are uh, defined from a related spec that is soon to be an RFC in the IETF. It's called the Sec Event Subject Identifier spec. And it defines subjects in different ways, right? So you can have simple subjects that have only one component, like an uh, email address or a user identifier, or a phone number, or whatever way you choose to identify a user, right? That uh, provides a lot of flexibility. Or it can be a complex subject. Now, a complex subject would be basically something that needs multiple entries to identify the same subject. Like in this case, you're saying that this is uh, the email, but you're also saying that, well, uh, this is the user with this email address, but I also want to say for which tenant in my system is that user uh, acting right now, right? So the same user might be in two different tenants, and you want to specify the tenant. So you can use a complex subject to clarify which particular uh, uh, you know, tenant that user belongs to, or whatever uh, you need to specify a subject uniquely, right? And there is some work going on, and there are some proposed changes to this where we can use the sub um, you know, field of a jot uh, to specify a subject by a single, simple string, and that would be a shortcut to just uh, any of these things. Um, the, the other uh, important claims, like I said, is the requester context, uh, which, um, you know, it's a claim that identifies the origina originating component. Like, you know, this came from this particular API gateway, or this, came, this call came into this particular endpoint, right? Or this call was originated from this IP address by the user. You know, all of those things that may be important to services that, that are down the call chain, right? Um, it can also have some other environmental information, like maybe you know your time zone or uh, other things that you know can be useful uh, for processing. Um, the uh, other one, which is purpose, and this is what gets into the transaction token server, which is going to issue that transaction token. Based on that external call, there is a representation of that. The you know what is that caller trying to do? Uh, that is trying to, we are trying to capture that with this field called the purpose. And the reason why this is important is because you don't want that transaction token to be misused in a way that is not intended of how it was supposed to be used in the first place. Right, so if, if Joe is calling for executing a trade, that token should not be used to say, well, give me historical data for this, this stock or something like that, right? So you need to be able to specify and you can think of this like a OAuth scope, but we are specifically not using the word scope here because uh, you don't want to confuse transaction tokens with OAuth tokens, and I'll get into that a little bit. And these are so completely different things, uh, just, just so you know. And so finally, the most important thing in the transaction token is the authorization details, right? So this could be like parameters that are um, specified in the external request, or it could be things that are inferred from uh, you know those uh, those parameters, right? Like for example, the last um, you know the last thing that you see over here um, is the user level, right? And the user level is uh, claimed to be a VIP. That is something that was inserted by the the issuer of that transaction token, right? It wasn't something that came into the external call, right? So it could be a combination of things that come into the external call or things that the transaction token service decides that needs to be specified and is immutable through the call chain, right? And so what this does is um, basically gives you a complete picture of what the user is trying to do, uh, 
where did the call originate from and what is the purpose of the call, right? And so let's, let's take a quick look at how this whole thing works, right? So this is sort of a flow diagram. The, the box at the top here is the external microservice that, are, that is going to be called. And this, like I said, it encapsulates any network infrastructure that you might have, firewalls, API gateways, and all that. And then from there, it sort of hangs all these internal services that, you know, that are just called uh, directly, right? And this is the new thing that we're introducing, which is the transaction token server. And so let's see how it works, right? So what happens is the end user or uh, the external application will invoke the um, uh, API microservice. And the API microservice will present the authentication information. It could be an OAuth token or it could be something else. It presents that authentication information, the call context, everything that comes in, and it gives it to the transaction server. And it says, okay, now mint me a transaction token, right, based on this. Now, important thing to note is, let's say you get an OAuth access token or an OIDC ID token or something in the input. You're not going to put that into the, the TRAT, right? The TRAT is like its own thing. It's just used to assure the transaction token service that, yeah, this actually represents a legitimate sort of uh, thing. Now, why this works is because if you can now control the evolution of your API microservice, right, then you can be sure about uh, you know, issuing a transaction token securely. Now, all the rest of your call, you know, your services in your call chain can have a CI CD pipeline that is, you know, not as secure as what is needed to update your API uh, microservice, right? And as a result, you get better security because let's say one of these internal microservices gets compromised, the damage becomes extremely limited, right? And so what this, uh, so let's, let's go into what that happens, what happens after that is that the transaction token server now verifies that request, makes sure that it you know, understands uh, you know, what the user is trying to do, verifies the trust on everything, um, does its own computation about what to put into that transaction to uh, token, and then issues the TRAD back to the um, API microservice. And then that transaction token is then issued, uh, then just propagated down in the call chain uh, all the way to any service that requires it, right? Um, so this is basically just how transaction tokens work. And um, okay, so how does the actual communication between the API microservice and the transaction token server work? It's using a, a spec called OAuth uh, token exchange, right? So there is an existing RFC on how you can uh, do a token exchange with an OAuth server. We're using that same spec uh, to issue transaction tokens, right? Even though what we're issuing are not OAuth or OIDC tokens, they're transaction tokens. Now, there is a specific way in which you have to use the OAuth uh, token exchange uh, protocol in order to use to get transaction tokens. And so uh, these, are the way, these are the things that you need to do is that you know, the subject token field has to be the external token that was used to authorize the external call. The subject token type is the external token type that you got and the RCTX parameter um, contains the information that you need to generate the track, right? Um, I'm sure you have a few questions about it. I'm happy to explain to you after the, uh, uh, after the uh, talk. Um, so now, in response to a, a, a OAuth token uh, exchange request, what the transaction token server does is it basically does all its computation of whether this is a legitimate request, you know, whether you know, this transaction token should be issued or not. It does all that computation and says, okay, now I'm gonna issue this transaction token. And then issues a particular transaction token. I explained to you all the fields. The token type in the response is TXN token, which stands for transaction token. And um, you know, uh, this is how the OAuth token exchange protocol fields are used uh, to provide the response. And like, uh, you know, there's no refresh token or something like that in the response. It's a uh, requirement of the strat creation process. Now, there is an additional case where somewhere down the call chain, you may want to specialize that transaction token even further, or you may want to modify something about that transaction token in a way that doesn't damage the security of the call chain. So it's a, it's a very sensitive operation, but it is required, unfortunately, in many cases. And so what you can do is you can also do a replacement transaction token. Now, in that case, what you're sending along in the OAuth token exchange request is just the TRAT itself, right? And maybe any additional things that you uh, 
are indicating to the TRAT service that, hey, I want this new transaction token to replace the existing transaction token, and this is what uh, I'm trying to do. Now, the, the TRAT server is, it's very important for the TRAT server to make sure that it, it's not negating the security by issuing this new transaction token, this replacement transaction token. But, you know, um, by is making all those checks, it can still issue a new transaction token back uh, to the requesting service. Uh, like I said, you know, there is a lot of caution to be exercised in this process. And, um, you know, this is what we recommend in the, in the spec. There's no requirement. You can do whatever you want, but at least these are the things that you should be careful about. You should not, uh, you know, change the purpose arbitrarily, or you should not, like, suddenly make it looser than what it was. Try to specialize it more. Try to uh, assert more values rather than removing values from the transaction token and things like that. Now, I told you that uh, there is, uh, you know, there is still a possibility that Let's say there is a call chain and uh, there's a service that is compromised and it's trying to bypass the fraud service and it's just directly calling the settlement service, just as an example of a stock trading operation. Current spec of transaction tokens does not uh, have a way to uh, identify the call chain. So to do that, what we are proposing is that, you know, we can have actually nested transaction tokens. And so what that does is um, yeah, I, I don't think I've, the slide is very clear, but a service in between can sign the transaction token by itself. So basically, it's let's say, you know, the external caller, Joe is trying to buy 100 shares of Microsoft. There's a fraud uh, prevention service in between that does all kinds of checks and says, okay, I've, I've processed this transaction token. I need the downstream services to know that I've processed it. So I'm just going to sign this transaction token myself. That's what creates the nested transaction token. And then that gets propagated down. And like I said, this is not yet in the spec. It's something that we are working on. Um, the, the drawback is that the, the transaction tokens tend to get bloated as a result, because now you have intermediate services that are uh, you know, uh, padding their own signatures to it. As long as those services are very limited, you know, not like every service needs to do this, um, you, know, you should be OK. But there now there's some additional consideration. There's also the problem that now those services have to be trusted because you cannot have them evolve the same way other services are. Otherwise, you're vulnerable to the same risks that uh, you know you're trying to prevent against. All right, uh, that was it. We still have seven minutes for questions. Um, if you want to know about Signal, the uh, the um, you know the QR code on the left uh, will tell you. And if you want to know about Trats. The QR code on the right uh, will give you more information. Thank you, everyone. And uh, it, if you would like to ask questions, please uh, come up to the mics so that uh, uh, you know. For remote users, it's uh, easier to um, you know uh, for them to listen. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, do I understand correct? Like, if it's, there's a call chain, then uh, service one will repurpose a token so that the operation of service two will happen. Uh, but then, uh, if you have to enforce some policies, then the transaction token server has to be aware of the, the flow of the, the operations uh, in order to constrain it. Uh no, I think what the transaction token server is trying to do is basically just assure something about that call chain. It doesn't really need to know which services that token is going to get propagated to. Because all it's trying to say is, this external caller is this person or this application that is calling. And it's saying that, oh, these are the things that are immutable about this transaction. Like this is the, um, let's say it's a share settlement transaction you know, these, this is the shares we're talking about, this is the quantity, you know, any other context that needs to be preserved throughout the call chain. It doesn't need to know which service is going to get invoked. Mm -hmm. but, but then when, uh, so let's say in your buying shares example, right? So there's a, a token that allows you to buy uh, the shares, but then you need to request the balance of the account. Uh, 
right? So then how would the service number two know that, okay, I can use a buy shares token uh, to give arbitrary uh, account numbers? No, so this, what the service is going to do is it's going to check the, the content of the track, right? Mm. It has the public key of the TRAT server, it's going to verify that this TRAT came from that server, right? And then it's going to say, okay, this allows me only to do these things, right? Mm -hmm. And so it can only do those things, right? And so even if it tries to modify something, let's say it tries to modify something about that TRAT, the downstream service is going to reject it because it, the, the signature won't compute, right, on the TRAT. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, my question is regarding the transaction token server. How does it um, verify that the claims that it's going to put in the JOT token are correct? Does that make sense? Like, how does it know that the API service isn't lying about which user made this request? Right. So that's a great question because that is exactly sort of the... your now limiting the trust to be just with the external endpoint, so the internal services that are, that are there in your infrastructure uh, can evolve much more rapidly without a lot of um, checks, but the external endpoint, which is your API microservice or could be the uh, you know, user-facing microservice or something, that needs to be secure because it's going to trust that microservice to give you um, some information like the call context and all that. It can give you the incoming OAuth token so that microservice won't be able to impersonate uh, someone else, like because there's an OIDC token, let's say, which has the identity of the user in there. And as a result, you know, the TRAT server will not be able to, you know, you won't be able to trick the TRAT server from in saying that, oh, it's not Joe, it's actually Atul calling. But because the OIDC token that is in the request will say that it's Atul calling, right? But there is a high level of trust between the API or the initial microservice and the TRAT service. Uh, this might be a dumb question, or, but uh, this reminds me of a little bit of the open telemetry and how you have like a tr root trace and then you have spans and you've got like telemetry being emitted by each individual service towards an outbound thing. Um, I'm wondering if there's any inspiration or anything useful there. Like, um, I'm not familiar with open telemetry, but just based on what you said, uh, there's been some discussion about how these tracks can be used to like log uh, the execution of a particular call, and that, that is definitely an offline use of the tracks, but it's not something that is core to the problem that we are solving. I guess what I'm thinking is, let's say you've got, uh, like you have the propagation, you have the root context, like so you're passing along this root uh, span for the request, each uh, service has its own like span ID underneath of the root trace ID. Um, if you wanted to do an authorization check, like say a, that the you know uh, the fraud service ran against it, you know Otel isn't used this way right now. But I could imagine like reaching out to this authorization system, you know, outbound, not carrying that information with the JOT, but to check that that happened. Yeah, I was just trying to find that slide that has that information. So. The trace ID is like the TXN here, right? But we don't have a span ID because each service cannot modify the track, right? It only comes, you know, it minted at the beginning of the call and is just used afterwards. Unless you want a replacement, then, then you have to go back to the track server and you don't want to do that all the time because otherwise you're going to make that track server work really hard, right? So that is the problem I see in, because in open tele, I mean, I don't know about open telemetry, but in other cases, you need a trace ID and a span ID. Like in a dapper, I don't know if you know about dapper. Uh, so th that's what I'm familiar with. Uh, that, um, you know, you need those things, and the TRAT can only give you the, the TXN, the trace ID, and not the span ID. So. Thank you. Thank you for the session. So question is, the transaction token, 
never goes back to the user, right? It's, it's no, basically... No, it's, it's only inside the... Inside. If so, you see the uh, audience value, right, it's, it's the trust domain that you have internally. It doesn't have any meaning outside that uh, trust domain. Okay, so second question is, you said uh, session hijacking, uh, this can prevent, right? But uh, Session hijack of a privileged user, it can prevent. But if an end user gets hijacked, then there's no impersonation because you're now thinking that the end user is making that specific call. But it's not a catastrophic compromise like the, let's say, Joe's session gets hijacked. You can only make calls as Joe. You cannot make calls as Atul or something else, right? That's true. So, no, but the insider also, let's say I have a privilege access. I passed a session or a, some sort of a token. And with that, you created a, a transaction token. So what if somebody inside compromised the initial token of an insider so they can act on his behalf with all the privileges, even with the trot, right? Right. So you're not, I mean, you're using these transaction tokens to uh, execute normal user requests, That's right? True. If you're using these transaction tokens to do privileged user requests, like modifying services and all that, I think that's a slightly different use case and maybe we can discuss that because I don't know how that will work. Uh, but yeah, I, I hope I answered your question. We are out of time, so maybe we can take the discussion sure. offline. Thank but you. thank you everyone uh, for sitting through the...